Welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people, all the while reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 165. This is Mark Fernandes, one of your co-hosts in the usual seat across the creek. And I can't believe I've never used this, but I'm going to throw it across the creek to my co-host, my ever-thriving co-host, Eric DeRosa. How are we today? Wow. Three, almost three and a half years of doing this every single week. It's the first time we've used the word thriving to describe either one of us. That is very... We're very open. We're not always thriving. That's number one. No. We've been very candid in sharing that. And I don't remember when I started using the words, right? Because we had the number game. I was doing all these different things. But I would say it's been at least a year I've been using the adjective to describe you. And when I was getting set and putting the headphones on today, and I'm like... He's thriving. I can use it today. <laughs> and it, as we know, we always talk about thriving, the word itself. People often associate it with rainbows, unicorns, and glitter. Nope. And everything is perfect. But the reality is it just means that you have something together in that particular day or in that particular moment and you own it. And it looks completely different for so many different people. So yeah, I'm glad we I'm glad we get to use that on the air. Well, and I guess it, it means whatever you want it to mean. Cause like for me, I can generally thrive in like one or two arenas of my life, and everything else can be a dumpster fire. <laughs> and it never it's always shocking when I tell people I'm like, actually I'm really stressed out right now. And they're like, you don't look it. I'm like, that only makes you feel worse. So <laughs> but when I think of thriving and I've never put a number on it, maybe I'll think about this, but you know, it would have to be in more than two like segments of my life, whether it was family work, all the different jobs and things I do or whatever, but knowing what you've got in the pipeline and travel and stuff with your lovely Amy, I, I, I can easily put the thrive sticker on you right now. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Ski ride, be the most you. And I'm going to yep. leave it at that. Yep. Since I'm thriving, how are you doing? I'm thriving today. The past couple of days have felt a little bit more survivor mode, not through my own sort of mental stuff, just a lot of things coming at me all at once. But today I was able to, I got an awesome night's sleep, got up early, got ahead of things. And as you can tell, since I logged in like right at four o'clock, not with my hair on fire. And like, I have four things I have to do before we record. That's probably a good indication that I'm, I'm ahead of it and feel I'm thriving. Yes. And it's also that time of year where we are not bound by the ski schedule and we can do things a little bit earlier in the day, which is, I think, I know, I know, (laughs) but we'll keep that on the back burner for now. And let's go to somewhere where the weather is starting to become really hot in Florida. Joining us today is Erin Copeland. Erin is a speaker, best-selling author, licensed massage therapist, and real estate investor. In 2009, she was appointed sole caregiver to her husband as he was diagnosed with cancer, underwent multiple surgeries, and a successful liver transplant. In her book, Welcome to Caregiving, The Things Caregivers Never Talk About, she writes a lot about her mental health and the effects caregiving had on her, including believing she could outsmart depression and episodes of PTSD. With caregiving experience that spans over a decade in multiple states with multiple medical centers, Erin was called to share her stories with the underserved caregiving community. She was called to share hope, community, and love. She loves riding the ocean, snuggling with her kitties. Oh, I can understand that. And learning pottery. With that, let's welcome in Erin. Hi, Erin. How are you? I am excellent. How are you both today? I I feel like I'm actually on the upswing 
of my Thriver day. The morning didn't start out so hot, but it's it's turning into a good evening, turning into a good day. So, well, we'll hope to keep Excellent. that going for you. Yes, <laughs> and I. So I think at some point, Mark, hearing Erin say that, we also need to create the from survivor to thriver continuum. That just came out of a meeting I had with some folks a couple of hours ago. We were talking about this continuum of like where you are on the mental health spectrum. And I like this. So Aaron is currently an up, an up sloping thriver. How about that? <laughs> well, and I'm going to lean on you and your past in the financial world. I think it needs to be like, like a reverse curve or like there has to be some sort of like way that we can put the different sort of stages of it within the continuum. And then we need a visual graphic, of course. Well, you're talking <laughs> about a, a supply demand curve. And, yeah. and in this case, demand is upward sloping. There's also, a, I'm, I feel like I'm going right back to my sophomore year in college for econ 101, an opportunity curve, right? The trade-off curve. So more thriving, less I was, surviving. I was thinking, I think like, I'm not an, I don't have a degree in economics like you do, but I do think I was thinking about the opportunity curve. That was the one yes. I couldn't get the word. Cause it wasn't the supply yes. demand one. Cause that one, yep. that falls more on an X, Y axis. I was thinking more of one of those like swoopy ones. Yes. <laughs> yes. Theater major <laughs> over here. If anybody's wondering. Okay. That's right. right. Theater major. Last math class was the junior year of high school. And I took computer sciences cause I could actually program a computer in my sleep at that point in my life. And I just wanted classes that weren't hard. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know if we've told people I was an economics major before. Economics, so. undergrad, and an MBA in finance. So how do you yeah. like that? Yep. And it almost broke your brain. Cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, enough of, of our bullshit, Aaron. Welcome. And honestly, fully selfish, I'm going to tell you right now, I already wrote down four questions. I have yeah. a very close family member going through a caretaker situation right now. And as soon as we get off this, I'm jumping on wherever you tell us to buy your book and sending it to her, or I'm going to bring it with her. Cause we're going bring it with us. Cause we're going on a trip together in a couple of weeks. And <laughs> it has been so hard as someone who's been in very short caretaker situations myself. This one has been extremely long-term and I love this person very much. And she's amazing and doing everything she can, but it is beating her. Like it, I, I can see the difference in her over the arc and the time of it. And if you, obviously we're going to go into super depth on this, but one of the things I've noticed from her, from myself and other caretakers I've talked to is the constant doubt. Am I doing the right things? Am I being supportive enough? How do I balance taking care of myself versus this person I'm caring for? What would you tell someone just in a, like, the, like, I guess what we're saying, what I'm saying is give me, give me the opening couple bullets and then we'll get into depth here as we go. So I wish I could say there was a magic cure that made any of it easier and there just is not. And so the reason I wrote my book, it is very, it is a hundred percent. You are not alone book. I shared my experiences. I share everything that I felt like I learned in hindsight, just so that if like anybody could glean the slightest insight from and go, oh my gosh, I'm down this path. I can pivot now. That's, that's why I wrote the book. I think people just acknowledging what you're doing is huge because there is the, the weight of what somebody's doing, she, she's responsible for keeping a person alive. And that is what caregivers are tasked with. And it really is approached, I think, by caregivers and really by our society as it's just what you do. I mean, it's in our wedding vows, <laughs> for better or for worse, sick or poor. And it's very easy to agree to those things when you're at an altar and there's cake and there's flowers and <laughs> lovely. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything differently, but it's a much different experience when you are living it than when you're saying, of, of course, I will take care of my person, whether it is um, a spouse, a child, a parent. I was just very recently one of the caregivers for my grandmother and I wasn't her primary caregiver. I was kind of 
third in the line, but I was, I was the communications specialist. So I went to all of the doctor's appointments with them. My grandmother was 94. My grandfather is 97. And so I went to all the appointments with them and then translated everything to them and then communicated everything to the rest of the family. And even though I've been doing this now with just my husband and I for 15 years, I, I was a wreck. I was a wreck because it was exactly what you were talking about, Mark. I didn't know, did I explain it right? Do they really understand? Am I asking the right questions? Because they might not be thinking of them. What is my family thinking of me? Did they think I should be asking different questions? Should I like all of the things? And that actually, even with all of the work that I have done, the PTSD came back in ways it was mean to me <laughs> because well it has it no feelings didn't come back in the <laughs> usual ways <laughs> i started having night terrors and i had never had that before and thankfully because of some of the work i have done i was like okay this isn't okay this isn't right and i was able to fall into some of the tools that I use, I was able to go to my therapist and go through, through some talk therapy and get that under control more quickly than like, if it was, you know, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have had any idea and I'd still be having night terrors. So I, I really, to answer your question, I think letting her know that you see her and you support her. And a lot of times those words, they, they mean a lot. It means a lot. Well, thank you for confirming because it's it's funny. As you were answering, I realized I'm actually very much in touch with three people I'm very close to who are all in caregiver situations right now. And this week, especially one of them, I literally was like, there's no right answers. You're doing everything you can. And I, I'm not doing it. So I won't tell you I know how hard it is to do what you're doing because you're the one doing it. But I can tell you. Anytime I've been in this situation, it's the hardest shit I've ever done. So thank you. I guess I'm doing the right things, but it is, it's one of those things where, especially when you care deeply, right? Like all the, generally when you end up in a caregiver situation, unless you're a professional, it's someone very close to you. It's someone you care mm -hmm. for incredibly deeply. And I think that's one of the hard things I've seen people wrestle with, including myself, is as you're going through and making decisions, it's very easy to be like, am I being selfish? Am I making this decision because I think it's the better one or I think it's the easier one? And and then you either have that next lens of the rest of your family, other loved ones who are around it. But I'm thinking specifically about one of these situations where this person is sort of on an island. The person they're caring for is very advanced in age. They have no family. And so they're it. And that... I think that in some ways can make it even harder because you don't even have that other person who knows that person as well, or maybe more or close to as well as you do to use as sort of a backboard. You end up reaching out to people you care for and that you're close to, but it's not the same. Something I just wanted to back up for a second on something to, to get a, a little conversation going, but also to help our audience. And we did an episode about a year ago around caregiving and caregiver mental health. And that was very much focused on people in the professional world, especially as it related to doctors and nurses and uh, people who are in, in the hospital. And from an individual standpoint, it is so much different, looks different, feels different, in many ways can be much harder where a doctor can move from room to room and leave the hospital right at the end of the day, when you become a caregiver, especially for a loved one who you're with 24 seven, that, that role in many ways, and, and I'm, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this, Aaron, that role really becomes who you are. Yes, it, it does. <laughs> it, it becomes who you are. It also can change the relationship that you have with the person. I mean, I went from being a wife to being a nurse and then had to find my way back to being a wife again. 
Sometimes I'm better at it than yeah. other times. <laughs> There's still very much the conversation of, did you take your pills today? And when are your next scans? And all of those things, because those, they're ongoing mm-hmm. things for us. So it, it changes a lot about you. Yes. As, as a person. And there's some things that are heightened as well through the experience. I, I spoke to a kidney transplant support group earlier this year. And at the end of me sharing my experience, they're like, were you, so have you always been like this or did caregiving bring out <laughs> these tendencies? And you know, I said, Oh no, no, no. I, I was a codependent person. So let us not misunderstand that. I kind of came out of the womb codependent and the caregiving really heightened all of those tendencies. So it made me an amazing caregiver because I put everybody else ahead of myself, but it also really hurt me. And so so that can only last too long, right? I can only last so long. Yeah. It can only last so long. It can only last so long. I'm curious about something you said, Aaron, and that was the role of going from wife to caregiver and then going back and easing your way back into that being a wife again. What what was that what was that first transition like for you? And then how have you found a way to be able to when needed kind of drift right back and forth in between those two roles without it necessarily always overlapping. So I, I feel like it probably, it probably took me a solid three years <laughs> to be able to go from caregiver kind of back into wife mode. My husband was recovering and we, we kind of laugh about it, but not funny because it, took me at least twice as long to recover from his transplant than he did because he had drugs. I did not. So (laughs) there's even when, when he read my book, he was like, he didn't remember half of what happened. And interesting. And I was, I was living it for both of us and holding all of the fear for both of us. And so part of the empathy again, kind of turned into that codependency and enabling. So we're three years in and I'm still filling his pillbox every week. And, and it was just as part of my, my recovery. I mean, my poor husband, <laughs> but I was like, yeah. you're, you can do this. <laughs> you, yeah. you can, you can do this. And I had to hand that task back to him and, and step back. And it was hard. It was really, really hard for me. And, but that's just one pivotal moment for me. And it was just little things like that, that me giving his life back to him for him to live it so that I could coexist next to him and with him instead of for him, if that makes sense. It makes sense. And with that, yeah. (laughs) How, and just hearing that, how much nervousness was involved with that for you and how much uncertainty, right? Like you're, it's, it's almost as though you're, I'm just using the analogy. It's almost like raising a child where you slowly are like stepping back, stepping back, stepping back. But there's, I'm guessing there's that fear associated with it of, am I doing this too soon? Am I, is he fully capable of being able to handle these things on his own? And yes. So on, no. And, so and, and you can say it like, I was like, I kept you alive. Don't kill yourself. <laughs> well, I was thinking when, when Eric brought up the child situation, I, I was actually flashing back to a, a great conversation I had with my dad. It was, we weren't married yet, but I was with my wife at the time. And, and he said something sort of off the cuff. And I was like, well, I'll figure it out here or there. And he's like, yeah, I've learned that. There was that moment where I was like, well, let's see if he fucks it up. <laughs> and I was like, you never told me that. And he's like, well, I didn't think you needed to hear it, but I was certainly watching. And I was like, Oh, that makes sense. And now being much older and having nine nieces and nephews and so many of my friends having kids, there is that moment. And it, and as soon as Eric said it, I was like, Oh yeah, no, there is that. I was actually also thinking my wife should probably read your book just because even when I'm not sick, I need caregiving, but there's this <laughs> sense of release 
but I don't even know if I would use the word nervousness, like trepidation. Like I'm thinking bigger words, right? Cause like there has to be that moment of like, I know I shouldn't continue these behaviors. The person is healthy and even for their own benefit and their own esteem, self-worth having mm-hmm. the reign, so to speak, but that letting go, especially after as long as many of these caregiving things, I can't like that almost seems like it would be the second book. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, there's, there's so many books. No, everything, especially everything I went through them with my grandmother was like just a different perspective on everything. And every day my husband was like, here's another chapter. Here's another chapter. I'm like, I don't want any more chapters. I don't need any more <laughs> chapters. I am. I am this good. book is too damn long and I'm living it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I want to come back to something that was in your bio and this, and I think any of us who have struggled in our lives whether it be with mental health issues or in this case, mental health issues as a result of caregiving, or you had mentioned that you were along the way, you just kept trying to outsmart depression <laughs> and PTSD. <laughs> and I'm, I guess I did, one, I did love that. I, let's share yeah. some secrets. <laughs> what, what, what were some of the, the signs and symptoms that you may have not even recognized along the way. And then at what point did you realize like, oh yeah, I'm dealing with these things, but I'm going to figure out a way to jump over them, work around them without them getting in the way of my day-to-day life. Okay. So here's, here's the big story, the the pivotal moment. So we are, let's see, where am I? Yep. In Florida. So it's post liver transplant for my husband. And I'm like, okay, I know caregiving is hard. I know I have a history with depression. I know that exercise helps. So I'm going to join Orange Theory. Now, if you guys heard no Orange Theory, Mm -hmm. the whole, okay. And I was not previously working out. So I joined. I'm just Orange laughing Theory. knowing what Orange Theory is. Yes. Yeah, that's like trying to run a marathon off the couch, you crazy person. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I joined Orange Theory, and I this I don't know if this is just me. Those little heart monitor things, no matter where they are, mm-hmm. if they're on my chest, on my arm, whatever, they don't read me. They just don't read me. So here I am at Orange Theory, and I'm at the first station, which is the treadmill, and I am running and running and running, and my face is purple. And the coach is screaming at me, Aaron, you're in the green. We need to get your heart rate up in the orange. And I'm like about to pass out. And so she checks everything out, realizes it's not working. I'm just, I finished the whole thing, but I feel like I'm going to die. And And she's not being a very good caregiver in that moment. No, she's not (laughs) caring for me at all. She's just yelling at me to go faster and push harder and all of the things. She's doing her job. Yeah, I I guess, Mark. I guess. <laughs> so I go to therapy. Hey, you signed I'm up like, for this. I did. <laughs> she signed up and for I, a working heart rate monitor, Mark. <laughs> well, but did you tell everyone that you've worn heart rate monitors before and they don't work? No. See? I No, I just, I thought theirs would be better. <laughs> Different. You know what the word assume splits into, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say this with love because I would make the same. Actually, I'd be the one with the heart rate monitor at like 182 and be like, I'm a hockey player, dude. Everything's fine. Let's go. <laughs> so, so you go, so so you know, you go to not, your therapist. You go to the therapist. I go to my therapist and I'm like, she's going to be so proud of me. She's going to say like, Aaron, good on you. Like, you've got this. Why hasn't anyone figured this out before? You have dodged depression and you're you're golden. But instead she looks at me with like kind of squinty eyes and she goes, so Aaron, do you think maybe that's a lot? I was like, what, what do you mean? She's like, well, have you been working out? And I was like, well, no. And she's like, Aaron, <laughs> well, I was really disappointed because my therapist, wrong with you? <laughs> my therapist is not proud of me. I've nearly passed out in a gym place with neon orange lights and I still feel like crap. (laughs) And that's when it just all came together. It was like, okay, I can't why am I more why am I more depressed? Hmm. Right? (laughs) Like I can't skirt this. I tried, I tried my best, but I really need to 
actually face the facts here and and address what's happening to me. At what point were you actually then diagnosed with PTSD? Because I know for so many people, it can be at various times in their life. Sometimes it's not as obvious, right, to a therapist or a psychiatrist. Uh, and so the diagnosis, like in my case, came later. So I was curious for you. And I will say, I'm, I'm trying to actually think if my therapist has just agreed with me. I don't know if it's written in a chart somewhere, but very specifically, so my husband, after his transplant, his cancer came back. His cancer has recurred three or four times now. It had metastasized from the original liver pre-transplant, and then it's it just kind of does its thing and floats around. And so after one of the subsequent surgeries, he had to have his adrenal gland removed because that's where the cancer decided it wanted to live. And post-surgery, so everything went well. I talked to the surgeon. I knew the surgeon very, very well. And I knew everything was fine. And it was the same hospital, same floor, same everything. And I got off the elevator and I couldn't walk. My feet wouldn't move forward. I broke out in a sweat. I started to cry. I was shaking. I couldn't swallow. I had a, I had a complete... I had an attack, panic attack. And I walked into, I got to his room and it was meal time. So I got him set up for all of his food because that's what caregivers do. We go to hospitals and we do all of those things. So the hospital staff doesn't have to. And I said, I, Jerry, I think I just had an episode of PTSD. Now this was two years post-transplant. And bless my husband's heart. He goes, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I could see that. Um, but that was the moment. It was very real for me because my body rejected walking down that hall. And it was nothing. Again, I wasn't particularly afraid. I knew every, he was fine. Everything was okay. And my body was just like, this environment is unsafe. Bad you, place, bad place, bad place. Yeah. Yeah. Bad, bad place, bad yeah. place. <laughs> and as you said, you're, you're, I'm hitting with your legs, right? Your legs yeah. had walked down that very hallway. Two years before, right? Yep. And at that time, you walked with a whole lot of uncertainty and a whole lot of fear. And yeah, getting off that elevator, it's, it's to me, it's as someone who suffers with PTSD, it is not at all surprising that suddenly it would manifest itself two years later in that exact same spot. Mm -hmm. And then once again, when it's, when I was back in a caregiving position with my grandmother and I was in this place of great uncertainty and trying to process, but not really. Cause you know, I was, I'm the caregiving pro. I mean, I wrote a book, so I should be fine. <laughs> 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 Until that first night I sat up straight in bed, sweating, what completely panicked and full of terror. <laughs> I mean, so just, just for our audience, Stephen King still yeah. has nightmares. Okay, so writing a book doesn't like absolve you of these things. <laughs> well, but I was gonna, I was gonna say, and for our audience, can you give them a little insight because nightmares and night terrors are two very different things. Can you give them some insight into what these night terrors actually are, how they present? So for me, there, and I'm actually a very vivid dreamer. And this wasn't a dream. There was no, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad dream. And I had to wake up from, it was like, oh, oh, what was happening? It was, it was a sudden panic. Like I described walking down that hallway and my body was like, no, you can't be here. It was like my body just waking me up saying, you have to get out of here. And I just, I sat straight up in bed, complete. I was drenched in sweat and just wide awake, just like, right. It was like this rush of adrenaline and fear in me, like super fight or flight mode in the middle of the night with no, no dreaming, no nothing. Just that was my experience with it. Well, and I'm married to an incredibly vivid dreamer and 
the the other thing, so if someone's listening and they're like, I don't really know the difference between night terrors and dreams for me that I've noticed, I've never experienced it myself, but people I know is upon waking when you're having a dream, there's like a, like an, a slow exit where you realize you're leaving subconscious to consciousness. There's this sense night terrors feel incredibly real the entire time. And when you wake up, they don't leave. They, they, they linger is what I've heard. Yeah. Yep. So in kind of like going way back, if you think about your experience before becoming a caregiver, were there signs to you that some of this anxiety, some of these other things, and certainly the depression were like on the fringe or edges, or did none of it sort of show up until you were in the caregiver position? I am doodaloo, doodaloo, going way back, going way back, mm -hmm. trying to think about the first time I was given medication and if it was before or after the cancer diagnosis and it was after I don't care about medication as much though. Like were there, were there hints, I guess is what I'm asking. Looking back. Yes. But I wasn't aware of them. That's very common. And I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah. I, and just to fill you in and why I sort of asked that way is I suffered for depression basically my entire life at different points, right? Not always, but it showed up at different points and I've only had true anxiety issues twice in my life. And after my dad passed, it came back with a vengeance. Is that a good way to say it, Eric? <laughs> yes. It, it was yes. more present than it had ever been before. But and Mark tried to outrun it. <laughs> honestly, I don't even know if I would use the word outrun. I, I tried to get in the fastest car I could and outrun it. Not, not with these slow ass legs. I wanted as many horsepower as I could get and it didn't work. And, and and I asked that only because, like I said, some selfish questions. I've seen some behaviors cropping up in the caregivers around me. And I've been asking myself that exact question of, huh, is this just new? Is it only there because of this? Or are there lingering sort of things that are easier to handle when there isn't this amazing amount of stress due to the caregiving. So the one thing I, I will throw in there that I don't feel like any of my therapists addressed with me and really looking back and I'm getting much more into this now is really learning more about caregiver burnout because it can present as depression and it can present as anxiety. And so I was being treated for depression and anxiety and nobody was talking to me about caregiver burnout. No, it was just like, oh, you're in this situation. Oh, you're depressed. Here is a pill for that. <laughs> or I have to thank you for answering my next question before I ask that, because that's why I asked <laughs> that. Because it, it's one of those things where when someone's in this situation, you know, two of the people I'm thinking of specifically, I gave the advice of, look, I don't know if there's a longer scale problem here, but this is hard now. Just go see a therapist. And they're like, well, there's nothing like wrong with me. And I was like, okay, first off, fuck that. Like, just go see a therapist. Like if there's nothing wrong with you, then you'll have some boring conversations that'll cost you a little dough and you'll walk away. But it, it made me sort of think about the experiences I've had where it was sort of like the tip of the iceberg getting pushed. And then you saw the whole iceberg versus I'm sure there are people who may not have this, but when they're in that kind of situation, they do need some help. They do need some therapy and some coping mechanisms. So I, that's, thank you. you. Because that, that recovery after it's over, it's like, once they're better, you don't just get better. You don't get better in parallel with them. Um, and you're, and we're lucky if they do get better. My, my husband is amazing. My grandmother passed. And so you still have the recovery from the caregiving. And then if your person doesn't survive it's impacted and compounded by grief which is a whole other <laughs> that's well, a whole other say, episode guys <laughs> i don't know if i'm breadcrumbing you or you're just picking up what i'm putting down because that was actually the next thing the two out of the three caregiver situations i'm thinking about are terminal like there that's where mm -hmm. this is headed and that's a completely different thing 
We might have to have another episode. Yeah, both <laughs> both real because the grief is there. And one thing I learned very intimately is the the concept of perceived grief, which I moved through and I nobody talked to me about that either. <laughs> And didn't realize that through all of this, my my husband did almost die after his transplant. He had very uh, serious complications. And so there was the part of me that went to the place where he wasn't in my life anymore. And I was grieving that even though he was still with me. And so that perceived grief is also very, very powerful. So it, and you're living that as a caregiver as well. So there's all these complex emotions all it's, tied in together. So even if you're if you've, you're a mentally normally well adjusted <laughs> healthy person, that therapy it just it helps keep you that way, <laughs> and it shortens well, the recovery time. It shortens that recovery time because there the is thing. a recovery. There's, time. there's still recovery time, but you just hit on the part that I've observed in myself and others that I think is so challenging of. And I'm just going to throw this out there and it's, it's heavy and we can go as deep or not as deep as we want on it. But the grief and guilt associated with watching someone lose their faculties, their everything, and then feeling the relief when they pass, but having guilt of that. And, and, and as somebody who's gone through that personally, I don't think I've ever felt more torn apart or guilty emotionally over my own feelings. Like I'm one of those people who's like, my feelings are my feelings. I'll deal with them like this. And I'm like, okay, I love this person. I was crushed that they got this sick and then they just passed. And I'm like, well, it's better now. I, how can I say that? Right. But it was, and it's true. They were suffering incredibly and then they weren't. And that I've never, I've never experienced that. And I'm watching two people kind of wrestle with that. I would say present life grief where they're grieving the loss that they know is coming, I guess is how I would sort of look at it. Mm -hmm. And I just, if you're going through that, go, go to therapy, even if you're the strongest, most mentally capable thriver in the world, because that shit's real. It's, it's yeah. Well, what was your experience? And you have both experiences of like, you came out the other side after having that, like, goodbyes so to speak and then with your grandmother you had the the other what what could you say about that they're just very they're different experiences i and you know my my book is focused on my experience with my husband and so every like the work i'm doing now is just so much broader because i've had this other experience and my my grandmother was 94 she she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and the one thing i said to her was just whatever whatever you want to do that's what i'm going to make happen for you that's what i'm going to bat for she didn't want there was no treatment that was going to cure her it was it was too far advanced so we knew that and she didn't want to do anything else and so everything was done to make her comfortable but i i knew she had made that choice. So I was comfortable that she had made the choice and she had made it with her husband and I was supporting that. I was still devastated when she passed. I was the one that called 911 because she was in so much pain. That was a scenario I didn't want to play out. I didn't want to make that call because I knew I knew what was going to happen. And so, yeah, definite. I don't, and I'm trying to, I don't know if there's an element of guilt to it, but I knew what was happening. I knew it was the right thing, but I, again, I didn't want to be the one what, you know, how the other parts of the family were involved, all of those, all of those things. There's just, there's so many feelings in all of it and it's different for every person that you're a caregiver for. And I will say it is different for each experience with that person, because I don't respond the same way to each one of my husband's tests and treatments and surgeries that I did the one before. So I can't even anticipate myself. A hundred percent. And it's a wonderful answer. And and I'll be honest, as I was listening to you describe that, I was thinking about my different experiences, how different they were. And then all I could think about is how difficult it is 
you actually had an amazing sort of permission that you could speak to your grandmother about this. But we have so many caregivers in the world who are taking care of someone who unfortunately either is suffering from dementia or something where you can't get their opinions and you're making these decisions in the dark. And that they're all hard, <laughs> but that to me, like when I imagine that or think about that in my own life, like though that's, that's where it gets really challenging. Yes. And, and just, and it's painful. It's painful. It's, it hurts our hearts. It hurt, we feel it physically. It hurts our spirit. It it hurts. Yeah, it really and, hurts. And you don't have to take on the word guilt. I'm the one that used that one. And I was describing my own feelings in a situation like this, where we were caretaking for someone who couldn't tell us what they wanted. And when I felt the relief of their passing, I felt guilty. So I'm not going to make you on that, Aaron. That was on me. No, but it, it carries, it's a big feeling for caregivers all the way around. Even, even feeling joy can make us feel guilty. You get in moments where it's a, a time for celebration. You might be celebrating something in your own life, but the person you're taking care of isn't well. And so you, there's a guilt that comes in there too. It is very, it's so can. complicated, the feelings. And so one of the things I'm working with caregivers now is these, I'm calling them pillars of awareness, feelings, and movement. And going back to those three things to move through them just to help help with the burnout and try and trying to help keep this, the trauma from like sticking because you can't avoid the trauma. We know that from orange theory, (laughs) can't avoid avoid the trauma, but we can help try to soften the journey. We can help make the recovery a little bit easier. And so I've tried to go back into all of my experience and say, what was I missing? What did I not have? What didn't I know? Well, and, and with that, Aaron, I want to be able to give our audience some, some very helpful and tangible right advice from your own lived experience. And one thing we know is and those of us who have been in caregiver roles, we often tend to neglect ourselves, right? We're not good when it comes to our own personal self-care. And so now in the world that you're existing in, what are some things that you're doing specifically and, and how have you been able to focus at times on your own self-care, such as you were just talking about, being able to celebrate those moments of happiness and joy in your own life, while still at the same time knowing that uh, somebody that you're caring for is sick? Is How are you able to, to balance those two roles? And again, it's just, it's not it's not easy. And some days it's better than others. And, and so going back to those three pillars I just mentioned, really trying to find a place of awareness, which I think it's a little bit, there's a component of being present to it, but it's really acknowledging where you are and what's happening, which is like the gateway then into being able to feel and name your feelings And then if like, I like this happy thing is happening, but I am feeling lousy about it. I'm feeling lousy. We have to let ourselves feel lousy. We can feel both things at the same time, but you have to let yourself feel lousy. You have to feel where it lands in your body. And then I've been working in a component of somatic movement to help, to help move it through your body. And when you can move that through, then you might be able to access that space for the joy. Maybe the space for the joy comes in next, the next day. Maybe it comes in next week because we can't, we can't force them. But the more we push all of that aside and shove it and hide it and say, nope, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be happy right now. This good thing happened. (laughs) It will show up. It'll show up. Maybe you're just not. It's going to show up somewhere. It's going to show My shoulder was aching last week. And I was like, why, why is the shoulder hurting? What did I do? A massage therapist doing my massage thing. And I looked up the emotion behind the shoulder and it is grief. It is grief. Hmm. Like, oh, where is the grief hiding? So <laughs> it's only, it's been a month since my grandmother passed. I'm like, where, where is it? I've been trying to do the crying. I've been trying to do the feeling, but <laughs> the, yeah. the, the body holds it. Well, and, yeah. and I love, 
I love everything you just said and it sort of sparked something in me because no matter when you lose someone like that, one of the times that this grief shows up is like a momentous occasion. And I say this from experience. I, I'm not just saying this. I, I've officially lost count of how many weddings I've officiated. It's in the teens. And generally you often invoke names of the people that the married couple wish were there that day. Right. That's it, it's often built into the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've always tried to handle with like reverence, but also the idea of like, we are invoking them. So they are part of this celebration. Right. And when you think about that, obviously it's still hard. We know that, but what would you, what would you think about it in that situation of like, I remember officiating a wedding in front of someone who I'm super close to the person who I'm mentioning, we wish they were there and it's hard. Right. But how, do, how do we, in our minds flip it to where the celebration is the celebration and we can celebrate their spirit and the fact that this wouldn't happen if they had never been on the planet with us. Right. And, and honestly, I'm even thinking of my own wedding. My grandmother took ill. She actually lived years after this, but she couldn't attend our wedding. And I remember very clearly the officiant was like, oh, do you want me to speak to this? And I was like, no, everyone here knows she should be here and I will be sure to speak to it. And she was like, what? I don't want to give you that pressure. And I'm like, she's here with us. I'm going to call her before the ceremony. I'm going to call her after the ceremony. And it's different because she was alive. She just happened to be in the hospital. But I think you can, or please tell me if I'm insane for saying this, you can have that same sort of reframing of that behavior of like, we're naming them in joy, not in grief. Yes, I, I agree. And I, and just naming them, having, being able to speak about it, being able to have whatever emotions you're going to have about it and try to hold the space for other people's emotions because everybody knows they're not there. Everybody knows everybody's feeling that same thing. And so if it can be spoken and if it can be felt and maybe somebody cries, cause we all think, Oh, I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to make anybody cry. I don't want anybody to get upset. It's already there. They already know you're not bringing, mm -hmm. you're not reminding them. You're not bringing it to anybody's attention. But when those feelings get to flow and the emotion gets to flow, I feel like that's when the good memories come. I feel like that's when you remember somebody's laugh. I feel like it it invokes their spirit instead of again hiding it somewhere. I I love how you said that. And I and just to be clear, there were only 50 people at our wedding, so everyone knew my grandmother wasn't there. Like and that's why I was like we don't we don't have to like mention it during the ceremony. The wedding's the wedding and she's everywhere here. And it was it, and it didn't even occur to me until you started kind of answering that second to last question we had asked of how do you sort of manage that for yourself? And I realized I was like, oh, I was a dumbass 26 year old when I got married. But that part I knew I was like this, like we could say all the names, but in how we celebrate is how we will actually honor them. And it, it, I personally, I can tell you, it flipped my grief into immediate joy and it, it's if you can find your way there, which I know not everyone can, but if you can find your way there, it it's awesome. It will warm your heart. It is. Yeah. yeah. I have one more question that I had written down. Okay. In my selfishness. So we've talked a bunch about this sort of recovery sense, different things we can do. And I feel like it's all part and parcel with other things we've talked about, just taking care of ourselves mentally. But the other question I had was, the relationship changes, right? So you're in a relationship that has lasted through caregiving. It sounds like a couple of episodes of caregiving, but you're still married. And what are some of the things you've talked about with your husband, your partner, or how have you navigated that together versus Aaron has to do this work? It's like, no, this is going to happen together, right? <laughs> like, so it was just one of the things that popped into me immediately because I, I honestly, and if you wanted to talk about this as well, caregiving, like you said, it was a, you were the third in line with your grandmother, the relationships with your brother, sister, mother, father, daughter change as well when you're put in these situations. And, and I feel like people don't really talk about that very much. Whew. So first I will say there's are still some conversations in my house that are 
husband, I'm doing all the things. <laughs> so, hey, Eric and I are going to be sick, and trust like, me, our Amy say that to us, and we deserve it. Like, I'm not really sure that's a caregiving thing versus a husband <laughs> wife thing that's like, hey. And I'm losing the first part of the question you asked for that. So I'm going to answer the second part, and then we can come back to the first because you might have to rephrase it a little bit for me. There, I'm not sure that the dynamic particularly changed between family members and caring for my grandmother, but I learned a lot. I saw a lot. I gained a lot of compassion. I saw a lot of pain in people I had not seen before. I had not witnessed before. And... So yeah, it gave me more compassion. It gave me more respect. It gave me a deeper understanding of a lifetime worth of things. And yeah, some roles may have shifted a little bit. Like I'm a little, since my grandmother has passed, I'm a little more in charge of things for my grandfather to help him navigate things. And some things I was asked to do, some things natural naturally fell to me. But yeah, there's there's definite definite shifts. My my sister lives, uh, she's in Miami, so she's not super close, so she's involved and involved and I will say very helpful because she was very thoughtful and on the days that she knew I was like crying, <laughs> she either called me up or showed up at my house. And was like you want to talk about whatever this is? Do you want to go for a walk? Like she was that. She offered support to me in a way. And just that, just that text, like, hey, you okay today? The like going back to the way beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge, huge. I had a friend once, it was like, hey, what what do you want from Chipotle tonight? <laughs> and it was delivered to my house because she lives in Arizona. Well, and I think um, a lot of people don't wow. realize how important those things are at times. And the first part of my question actually dovetails right into what you were just talking about. It was, so in the family caregiving situation, yes, I, I do feel like your understanding, empathy, compassion can change. It can also break things apart. We don't have to talk about the negative parts. But specifically in thinking about a caregiver situation where the partnership continues with you and your husband, like what did those conversations kind of show up like as you so he's recovered he gets the clean bill of health and then a month later your therapist is like you have to stop loading the pill bottles go tell your husband and that's that how that dynamic would shift and how that would show up for you yeah and my my husband is famous for saying to me Aaron just be the duck just let it roll off your back and that is that is how he is so when i'm like jerry it's time for you to do your pill box now and he goes okay <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fortunate that way in my house that he he just rolls with things like that. I've gotten through this whole process in my recovery just so much better about communicating about how I'm feeling and even just I it was just this morning cuz I told you the day didn't start great. So he got up after me he was like, "How I woke up, you weren't in bed. What's how are you?" I said, "I I'm not great today. I'm not great." I might cry for no reason. So whatever you may or may not say something to me, and I may just cry for no reason, and it's not has got nothing to do with you. It's yeah. all this. Don't take it on. Don't take it on. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. And so it's really it's that's been a huge evolution in our relationship through all of this is just that kind of communication. And it's really been more on my side because I've been the one that's been up and down. He's He's like, my liver works. Everything's cool, dude. Yeah, I'm, I'm awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. I've got a 25 year old liver now. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm drinking about fish. No, just, well, that's what I would think. I, Aaron, I can't thank you enough. That answer was even more than I had hoped for or expected because it, it really does come down to like just dealing with the present and who you are today and what your partner shows up at. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before we end though, and Eric will have time to chime in, but let's make sure people know where to find your book, find you and find your work. Everything is on my website at AaronCopeland.com. That's Aaron with an E, Copeland, no D. No D. And no D. 
here with Nico Planodip. My book is there. I've got some free resources there. One of them is a free download of 10 ways to support a caregiver or for all these people who just have caregivers in their life. They, they want to love. I've got one, five ways to celebrate without cake or champagne. So I'll be, I'll be getting on that right after we get off. A couple, couple of things on there. So, yeah. <laughs> but if there is cake and champagne, we can have it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Just checking. Mm-hmm. Just checking. <laughs> All right, Jenny, you put it to we love our cake and champagne. <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll have a small piece of cake. I'm not a big fan of the champagne, so I'll pass on that. I'll drink the rest. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and with our audience. And I really appreciate your insights from a caregiver perspective. It's, it's something that's often very overlooked. And I think the attention always goes towards the person right? In need, whether it's from a physical health standpoint or a mental health standpoint. And I know I can speak for myself when I say, once I've moved through that, I am in a much better place. However, the wake that we then leave behind for the caregiver is something, as you pointed out uh, very well, is something that can often take some time. And so I, I appreciate you sharing all of those insights and recommend everybody who's listening and who is in a similar role or been in a similar role, please go out and get a copy of Aaron's book. Uh, And if you do, as Mark had said, and Aaron had said, if you do feel as though at any point it's a little overwhelming or you're feeling off or you're, please reach out to a professional, reach out to a therapist. It's no different than going to see your doctor for your annual physical. It can only be helpful not hurtful. Thank you. Thank you both so much for having me today and letting me share time with you and with your audience. I've appreciated it very much. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, it's always better to check in than check out. I was just, just saying, do it. Thank you, Eric. On behalf of our incredible guest, Aaron Copeland, Aaron Copeland, no D, Eric DeRosa, definitely a D. (laughs) And myself, I just want to give a huge thank you. And Unfortunately, death is part of life, and it always feels to me like we never want to talk about it. And Eric will tell you, I'm the one who loves to rip that Band-Aid off. I, I'm always like, yeah, we're going to die. We're all going to do it. That's why this is cool. That's why we got to do the shit we want to do right now. And my close friends love that about me. People who don't know me that well are like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> and I don't care about that, so it's fine. So please take care of yourselves. And it, it's the old airplane adage. If you don't put on your oxygen mask, you can't be any good to anybody. And if you don't start to take care of yourself while you're caregiving, it, the piper will be paid. You have to do it. So, and, and I'm saying this from experience because I didn't and it sucked and it sucked for way longer. Just like Aaron said, the recovery time can be shortened if we do the things for ourselves. So get out there and do it. On behalf of Aaron Copeland, my co-host, Eric Rosa. This is Mark Fernandes from Survivor to Thriver, episode 165, and I leave us with these words, as I always do, let's please all be as well as we can. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, we'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.